Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. My joy, my fun, my love, my opportunity to be here with you live with all of my live listeners on iHeartRadio, WAXE. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, I love you guys too. I love the fact that you're listening to me all over the world and that you're continuing to learn from the show and tell me what you're learning. That is my joy is to find that out. And you can reach me anytime at Laura at LauraSteward.com and Anywhere on social media at the Laura Stewart is my handle on virtually every social media platform that's out there. I tend to be more on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter than the other ones, but I do have a presence there. And with everything going on in the world today, with the whole idea of social isolation and everybody just needing to watch out and care for each other, I think it's really important that we all take a moment to think about how we're being in the world and who we're being in the world and lead with kindness wherever you can because there's so many crazy things happening in the world today. But if you lead with kindness, if you focus on the positives, because I know I've been having some panic stuff happening with everything I've been reading and because, you know, isolation is something they're talking about, but, you know, for almost A year plus I've had to stay home, but I've at least had people stopping in to say hi or check on me, and I've been very grateful for that, and even if you can't go in to your neighbors who may be older, give them a call, stand by their window, knock on their window outside the door, and just check on them, see if they need anything, drop food at their door, whatever may be needed. We need to remember, no matter what, that even if we are home alone, we are not alone because we are all there for each other. And I've been reading a lot and thinking a lot about what we can all do to keep ourselves sane, to focus on the positives, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, reach out and live a dream that we've had. And I know for a lot of people, writing a book is a major dream. Maybe you've got in a drawer somewhere, um, several partial manuscripts or in a file on your computer system. But you really don't know how to get the words out. You don't even know if what you've written is any good. Or you need somebody to help you, to boost you through it. So I'm excited for my guest today because she's somebody that um, we've written for a magazine together. And we were chatting the other day. I'm like, Elizabeth, you have to come on the show because you have so many great insights. So my guest today is Elizabeth Tan, commonly known as Liz. She is a nonfiction book ghostwriter, editor, author, coach, book writing educator. She works a lot with female coaches, speakers, and entrepreneurs who want to transform people's thinking. And um, Liz, I'm so excited you came on the show because, you know, so many people, this is their dream, is to write a book. It it absolutely is, Laura. And thank you so much for having me on, Um, talking about books and writing books and planning books. That totally lights me up. And and I just want to say what you said at the the top of the show is so true. So I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into talking about books and helping people, help making people's dreams come true. Now, right now, I have a stack of books, both in prep for the show and just other books that I recently got that I'm planning on hunkering down and doing one of my favorite passions, which is reading, you know, because you can completely take yourself out of the realm. And I do not have a single book on any deadly illnesses or anything like that. I'm just reading uplifting books right now. <laughs> so you're, you're not reading the hot zone again. No, 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 no. You know, I've always struggled with those kind of books because my mind can really deeply go there. So I find that, like my TV, I need the Hallmark Channel of books. I Yeah, I totally understand that. I, I tend to read a lot of business books, probably because that's the world I live in. Right. But 
I, I'm, I'm reading one right now that's actually a, a, a narrative fiction, and it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, a, it's about a murder back in the 1890s, and it's, it's great because it's taking me out of here, the here and now and thrusting me into something that I never could have lived, and it's, it, it's great, especially right now. Yeah, you know, I have to read a lot of business books because most of the guests on my show are, have a focus on, on business and how to improve your business or their books to help entrepreneurs. And I love them, and those are the books I write. And mm -hmm. but like you, sometimes we need to read something that shifts our brain a little bit. And what do you think it is about books that makes people want to write them and that has us, even though they've said the book industry is dead, it's bigger than ever. Well, you're absolutely right. The, the book industry isn't dead. And books are still, still selling in bookstores and certainly online books and all the different platforms that you can get books now. And you don't just have to have them in a hard copy form, although that is my personal favorite. You know, I think what what's going on today is, is that people are realizing they have information that is of value and want to be able to share it. And a book is such a terrific medium to be able to say, hold up if you're in the front of a room and you're speaking to say, you know, everything I've been talking about here is in my new book. And it's a way to reach people that you may not otherwise be able to reach simply because it is a, a, different, a different form of information. You know, podcasting is a great way to reach people, but not everybody listens to podcasts. And so if you're, uh, if you're writing a book, not only can you put all of your information into it, but it can be disseminated in a lot of different ways. You know, I think about that a lot because – for almost two years now, I've had sound-induced vertigo, and I've had to be mostly in silence. So that meant I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't listen to audio books. I couldn't listen to podcasts or radio. And it's funny because I'm on the radio. It took all of my strength of will to literally be able to do my show each week because the sound of my own voice could trigger me. And, but yet, wow. through it all, what I always had was the written word that I could always go to. <clears throat> yes. I mean, if, if I think back to when I, was, when I was a little kid, I had all kinds of health challenges. So a lot of the things that other kids got to do, I couldn't do because it was, you know, I, I just couldn't. And for me, books were my outlet. I could go around the world in 80 days. I could live the life of Abraham Lincoln. I could learn how to grow peanuts. I, you know, I mean, there were all kinds of different things that I could learn through a book that would either be fantasy or would, would teach me something. And I think that's why I work with books. Well, I know that's why I work with books today and why I'm a writer, because being able to share your thoughts, honestly, whether it's in a book or it's in a blog post, is, is part of the human condition. Being able to affect the lives of, of other people through what you say and believe is, is a powerful thing. Yeah, you know, it, for me, when, I remember when I sold my tech company and said, okay, I'm finally going to write a book. And I had been a book contributor prior to that but the, and, and a newspaper columnist and I had written for magazines and stuff but I'd never fully lived my dream of I wanted to write a book and I finally said okay sold my company my contract ended with the company that bought my company what's next and I just heard in my head write the book and the book was going to be called what would a wise woman do questions to ask along the way now I had no idea the process so I just dove in and started learning about the process and I landed a book deal right away. I, I wrote a book proposal, the whole nine yards. And, you know, I'm really grateful that people love my book, still love my book and are talking about it. But the process of putting my thoughts on paper and 
sending it to my agent and everybody, and they're like, Laura, this is really good, but, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but what? And they immediately saying, well, you know, with a title of what would a wise woman do, you've made the book very gender neutral. And I'm like, well, it applies to everybody. And they said, well, we know that, but you need to focus your book. And that was eye-opening for me. And I had hired an editor, Jocelyn Godfrey, and another friend, Linda Sterling. And I said, can you look at this and give me your advice? And to this day, I credit my, my agent, Michael Ebling, my publisher, David Hancock, and most of all, Jocelyn and Linda for taking my words and making them so much better. But yet people are so afraid of editors. And yet mm-hmm. here you are. You're an editor. You're a ghostwriter. What is it that editors do that m- makes it so much better? Is it like you're outside the picture frame so it's easier for you to see it? I mean, it takes a special brain to do what you do, Liz. Oh, well, thank you. I've been called special before. Um, <laughs> You're absolutely right. People are afraid of the editing process. And I uh, recently was uh, on in a Facebook group giving a, a, a bit of a presentation and answering questions. And one of the uh, potential authors, and she's actually working on her book, got a little bit out of shape when I was explaining the process of editing. And she said, well, I don't want someone changing my words and taking out my voice. And... I had to explain that that isn't the role that editors play in, in a book. We, we are the ones that come in and polish the silver and tidy everything up and make sure that, like a house, all the rooms make sense where they're placed. Because especially if you're a first-time author and you've never gone through the book writing process before and you've maybe never experienced a long-form writing project, it's really easy to get off track, to go off on a tangent, and to include things that that have no relevance to the book at all, or something you might think is funny, but that's probably not going to land with the majority of people that you want to read your book. So editors aren't the boogeymen of the, the writing world. We really have the author's best interest at heart. And sometimes, and I have had to do this on multiple occasions in my career, I've had to go back to an author and gently explain that their book isn't publishable, but here are the things that they can do to bring it up to the level that, that they would want to publish the book. And sometimes you need somebody that is an objective third party who's not read your words before to come in and maybe give you some, some bad news or conversely some good news, like, wow, this is awesome, and it didn't need a whole lot of, of, of uh, work on it, and you're really good to go. So the, the editing process is critical, and if you've ever read a book that wasn't edited, it shows. Because even the best writers that are out there today, they don't sit down and write a, a, a bestseller in a draft, and they don't, I mean, even in, in two or three drafts, I mean, some, some authors will write things and throw it away because it just isn't landing the way they want it to land. It's a creative process, and by bringing in an editor, especially at the beginning of a book, we help you stay on the road and get you from you know, where you're starting to where you want to end and make sure that all along the way you're including everything that you wanted to include. So I, the editing process, is, is it's fascinating to me. It, it, it's tedious, too. I will be honest. It's very tedious. <laughs> <laughs> so take me through the editing process. I mean, I know what it was like for me, and I know that when I chose Jocelyn to be my editor, I interviewed multiple editors and sent them the same several pages and asked them to edit it, and and one person, we just did not gel at all. I mean, he even changed in just those few pages almost like the context and purpose of the book and, mm. and the tense of the book. And I was like, well, that's not 
what my publishing deal is all about, and I don't think that's going to improve it. And he goes, well, you know, sometimes we're not the right editors. But Mm -hmm. how do you choose? How do you know? And then what's that process like? That's a great question because it is a two-way street. And when I'm talking with a potential author, uh, I'm, I'm listening to how they speak, what their goals are, what they hope their book will do in their business, and, in, and making my own decision, am I the right person for this book? I mean, I am niched down to a certain degree to working with women who are speakers and entrepreneurs and coaches because I love the transformational message. I love being part of helping someone change other people's lives for the better. I love being part of things that help change the world. And so as you, if you are an author and you're talking with editors, you'll want to understand what their background is and what types of books do they, do they work in. If you're, for example, working with a lot of numbers, if, that, if you're a numbers person, I would not be your gal. But I can, I can introduce you to someone who would love to edit your book because each of us has different specialties. So the editing process itself, from my perspective, because I can only really speak from my perspective, uh, when, I, when I receive a manuscript, the first thing I will do is read it. I read it as a reader because that's what your readers are going to be doing. And it helps me not only get a sense of all the subject matter that's covered, but it also helps me understand your voice and what what the how how you put ideas together, and whether or not things are hanging together, and whether or not I'm understanding it. So if I'm a reader, am I going to understand that concept? And so I make some notes as I'm doing that, and then I go back in and put my editor hat on. And that's when I dig in and really read the, the manuscript from a, a critical, and I don't mean that as a criticizing, but a, from a detail-oriented way of thinking. So I'm reading a sentence and I'm trying to figure out, does this sentence make sense in the context of this paragraph and in the context of this page? Um, again, this is my process. Other editors do it a different way. But I'm, I want to make sure that the book flows in a way and reads in a way that will pull your target reader in versus leave them asking questions about, well, I, they, they kind of left this thought hanging. Where did that go? And how come that story was never wrapped up? And, um, in, and, and I make notes to the author about those types of things. And once that's done, then I, I go through it again to make sure that I haven't inserted my own mistakes because, it's possible. Um, and I always tell my authors, I'm not perfect. You're going to probably see typos. And it's, that's, that's not necessarily what I am looking to, I mean, I try to catch them all. I may not just because that's after looking at your manuscript for that length of time, I don't know if you're familiar with the term kind of word blind, you become like butter blind. Your, yes. your brain begins to fix things that, thinks it should be there, like the the word A or the word the might be missing, but your brain saw it, and so you miss things. Um, My mother was a big proofreader, and she said to me, the best way to proofread your work, which is different than editing, but she said proofread to make sure words aren't missing, is to read it backwards. So from the last word to the first word, read it a word at a time, and then read the sentence. Yes. And that I do tell authors to do that. I don't know how many of them actually do it. Um, when I'm finished with editing, because the, the, actually all of the books that I've worked on have been through self-publishing means, um, then I, the, usually there's a proofreader that follows me. Uh, but before that, when I return the manuscript to a, my author, I'm aware that the, a lot of the editing that I do is, is much more substantial than, than what um, maybe someone who's written books before would go through. So I'm, I'm really what I would call a developmental or, or a sub, sub, substantive, it's hard for me to say, editor, where I'm working, again, with first-time authors who may not have put, um, may not have had someone guide them through the whole process of writing their book. 
and there are some things that are missing or some things that are hanging or they're using word conventions that don't work or they use pet words repeatedly so that the same word is coming up again and again and again and it becomes annoying because it's the same word. And so those are some of the things that I look for. When I return the manuscript to them, I give them a PDF, a clean version um, with all of the changes hidden uh, I'm sorry, with the changes there, but all of my red marks from Word hidden, and ask them to read that first so that they get a sense of how the book flows now versus what they sent to me. Because if they've been working on their book for a while and doing their own self-edits, they're going to have a really good idea of what they wrote. And the reason I ask them to do that is, one, I want them to see their book as in a new light, before they go back to that Word document, and as I had one person describe it, it was bloody, um, but it was because I was using red, and I've since stopped using red um, in, in track changes. Uh, and, and then they can, so if they read the PDF and then they go to the Word document, it, it, it's still probably shocking, and I do warn them. But it, it hurts less because they've at least gotten a sense of, okay, this does read better. And I've not yet had an author say, I, I, I hate what you did. So, Well, that's huge because I've worked with several editors. I'm like, what the heck were you thinking changing that? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and sometimes, and you know, they were able to give me a good reason. Another time they actually literally changed a quote and a context, oh. somebody I was quoting. Mm. And mm -hmm. I struggled with that because at the end of the day it's my words, right? So how do you help somebody, Liz, who's unable to let go? I know that's a tough yeah. question. Well, it, it is, and I'm, I, I mean, the, the reality is I can't make any author take what I do. I, in fact, I call them suggestions. It's like, look, this is your book. If you disagree with what I've done, said that's fine. Understand that I don't make changes arbitrarily, and I don't. Um, if, if something is unintelligible, well, I, won't, I, I might try to fix it in the context of what they've been writing, but then put a note off to the side and say, I'm not sure I got your point. Please fix this. Um, but occasionally there are the authors that are like, well, I'm, I'm just, it, it's not that they hated what I did. It's more that they are so married to their own words that they can't let that go. And I can't make anyone do anything. It's, it's their book. I think so, that's a really important point. You're, the concept of married to your own words, even though perhaps somebody has given you a different way of thinking about them from a different mm -hmm. perspective outside of yourself. And it's something that this show is really all about, is helping people shift their perceptions by giving them some new information. And I just, I've loved everything you've been talking about, but that really hit me quite a bit. Because mm -hmm. it is very easy for us to get entrenched in a way of thinking or a way of phrasing, but we also know our topic, right? And our readers may not. Exactly. And you're trying to read and the book said first off from the reader's perspective, and maybe they don't know all this stuff, so you need more stuff in there to simplify it or to set the foundation. And we're getting ready to go into um, the national news. So rather than get another thought going here and have you get caught off, everybody, I'm here with Elizabeth Tans. She is the founder of The Hired Pen, a company focused on copywriting, article ghostwriting, social media and blogging, and her focus now, um, she switched it to, and I love this, her original company was Hired Pen, and she switched it to Fuzzy Dog to complete, um, to focus on book only and in the memory of her dog, Katie. And... Everybody will be right back with more about editing, ghostwriting, and books. 
Welcome back, everybody. If you missed the first half of the show with Elizabeth Tans, um, you can catch it on your favorite podcast platform wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search for It's All About the Questions or my name, Laura Stewart, and it will pop up. I would love it if you would subscribe, rate, and review because it helps the show be found. Really, really grateful for all of your support on it. And because the show is also live on um, iHeartRadio and WAXE out of Vero Beach, Florida. We just got some breaking news. Mr. B, can you just share the information that just came from Governor DeSantis, please? Yes. Uh, it, I, I couldn't read the story because I'm trying to uh, produce your show, but uh, it was really quick on my cell phone that Governor DeSantis has ordered all bars and restaurants in the state of Florida to close at 5 p.m. this evening, Tuesday, 5 p.m. and stay closed for 30 days. I don't know if that means curb service or anything else. I'm just reading what it said. Okay. Thank you so much for letting us know that information, Mr. B. I think it's really important for everybody in town to know that. And to remember, don't lead with fear. Lead with love and kindness. And try to support those people who may not have some revenue coming in because of these closings and keep social distancing. Figure out some ways to help those who have need. And remember the food bank also, there are people that don't have access to money or places to buy food because of their circumstances. So try to help wherever you can. And thank you, Mr. B, for all of that that great information because we are live on the radio supporting our local community as well as the international community that this show reaches. So, so Liz, for me, books has always been a way of transporting me from whatever I'm going through. And I've read a number of books that I found out afterwards were ghostwritten. And I guess I define the difference between ghostwriting and co-writing is when somebody helps an author write the book, their name is on it, the cover, like Laura Stewart and so-and-so. But with ghostwriting, is it your name's typically not on the cover? And I wondered, is it really as good as real when it's ghostwritten? And I know it is, but can you clarify that for people? Because you're you've been ghostwriting for quite a while. Yes, um, yes, I have, and yes, the books are just as real and and tangible and reflective of the named authors, thoughts, feelings, attitudes. Um, It it is funny that I I still will have people say, well, it's not legitimate if if the book was ghostwritten, and that's cheating. And it's not, because not everybody can write well. Not everyone, even with an editor, you know, perhaps it's just not, it's just not their forte. Uh, Some people don't have time to write a book. And some people don't want to do it. You know, maybe, maybe it's just they, the, the thought of sitting down at a computer or um, with pen and paper and writing a book just makes them anxious and, you know, start to sweat because that's just not where their zone of genius is. And they're smart to say, okay, this isn't where I fit, but I want to write a book. I need to find the expert to do that. So it's no different, really, than if you need to get your car fixed. Now, there are some people who can fix their own cars, but there are a lot of us who have no idea how to fix a car, so we go to the expert to fix it. That's, that's how I equate ghostwriting, because I have to, as a ghostwriter, really step into the shoes of the person that I'm writing for. I have to become them, and it's probably as close to being an actress as I will ever come. And it's a fascinating in-depth um, type of process that I think most people aren't, aren't even aware of how in-depth it goes because I really have to understand not just what your material is, but I have to understand your motivation, who you are as a person. I have to be able to sound like you, um, which I also have to do as an editor. Uh, so when people say that it's cheating, it's, I feel like they're, they're really looking too, in too much of a limited way 
because really I'm just, the, I'm just a word expert and I know how to ask questions that elicit responses so that I can write. I'm always fascinated by the whole idea of ghostwriting because I have enough trouble with my own writing and I can't imagine trying to take on somebody else's voice and loan, learn it. You know, it's like these people that can do vocal impersonations. I don't know how they do it. it it's definitely a different way of thinking in your brain that you can sort of suppress your own writing style and your vocal cadences for the person you're writing the book for. John David Mann, dear friend of mine, has written, ghostwritten and co-written multiple New York Times bestsellers. And um, I'm always amazed because, you know, I, I read them and I go, and even though I know he's written it, I'm like, this isn't you, though. <laughs> so mm-hmm. how do you do that? How do you prepare yourself to write for somebody else to learn their cadences? A lot of it is what I call listening between the lines. So part of the ghostwriting process is a number of interviews with the author. That's usually the best way for me to learn how they speak, how they think, uh, where they might get off track in their thinking, um, what little favorite words they have. Those all go into the writing of, of the book. And you're right, I have to... to set aside any writing style I have. You know, mine tends, my personal style tends to be loose, a little, sometimes a little snarky, sometimes a little funny. That doesn't have any place in somebody's book because unless that's who they are, um, and, and that rarely happens that I'm working with someone who's, who writes just like I do. Um, I really do. As I said before, I have to become them. I have to think the way they do. And a lot of the authors that I work with also have written things, and that helps a lot because if I can see how they write their thoughts, that just ingrains it further because sometimes people don't write as they speak, which sometimes is very a good thing that they don't. Um, but most, most people have some similarities between the way they speak and the way they, they actually write. And if there is a big discrepancy, then... From a ghostwriter's perspective, if I write a book that doesn't sound like the author, I've done them a disservice. Okay. So when you're starting out either ghostwriting a book or editing a book, or let's even take it a step back further. When somebody has this thought, okay, I'm going to write a book, and we know they at some point will need an editor, at some point they may determine they need a ghostwriter. Whether they're self-publishing, they're going for traditional publishing, hybrid publishing, doesn't matter. Their goal is to get published in some way. Are there things, Liz, that people can do, that a writer can do to set themselves up for success from the start, to plan the process for success? Yes. I'm, I'm a big fan of planning because, and, and, and oddly, I'm not like that in my normal life. It's like, oh, let's go on a trip. Okay, let's just go and not plan anything. But when it comes to books, because I think because it involves words and lots and lots of thoughts, and if, if you're an expert in your business in, and in the field that you work, you're going to know a great deal about your topics. And without a sense of planning, you know, if you just kind of scribble down an outline, that's probably not going to serve you in the writing process. And I can tell you that I have talked with a number of authors who got to about three-quarters of the way through their book and realized they were writing the wrong book. And that's painful because if you're not writing every day for a living, then writing a book is a big deal. You don't want to waste your words and you don't want to waste your time. So my suggestion, if you are considering looking, or if you're considering writing a book, then the best thing you can do is sit down and look at the ideas that you have. So say you have three ideas for a book for your business, and 
you're not sure which one you should pursue. Well, the easiest thing that you can do is look and see what other people have written about that particular topic. If you're finding that there aren't a lot of books that are on that topic, that can mean one of two things. One, people aren't interested in the topic. Or two, you have miraculously come across a topic that is, is worth talking about that is niche down enough that you'll be able to get a lot of play for your book. And there are ways to determine that. So go out and look at Amazon and look at, look at what your competitors have been writing. If you get past that, you know, that step and say, okay, well, I've picked idea A. That's, that's, the, that's the one I really want to go with. But I don't know if I really know enough about idea A. The next step then would be to do some mind mapping around idea A to see how many links and topics you can come up with so that you have an understanding of whether or not this really is the right book for you to write. Because what you don't want to do is try to, to learn about your topic as you're writing your book, because then you're not an expert. You're becoming an expert, and readers will figure that out. If you write things that kind of gloss over the surface and don't go deep enough, they're going to know that you didn't really know as much about that topic as you say you do. So those are my two suggestions. Those are, those are great suggestions. I remember that when I reached out to, well, I got my agent and ended up getting a publishing deal, they all wanted to sign me before I had, the publisher wanted to sign me before I had written anything. And they said, well, we think you're great. We love your concept of your book, but you really need to write a book proposal. And mm -hmm. I looked at them like, okay, a book proposal. And they said, think of it like a business plan for your book. And in it, yes, you're going to give us a chapter or two, but we want to make sure that you understand where your book fits and the thoughts behind it. And I thought the process of writing this book proposal was the best thing I ever did for my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because like you said, I, I went on Amazon and I looked at other books books and like categories to see who might be like a direct competitor to my book. Um, I, I kind of hashed out a table of contents which formulated my thoughts and I did all of that and I went, yeah, you know, why aren't we treating the writing of a book like the creation of a business? Mm-hmm. And especially since people often write books to create a business. Now, they may not intend on that initially. The book takes on a life of its own. So planning a book that, that will be successful, however you want to define success. Some people define that as an Amazon bestseller. Or some people, New York Times or Wall Street Journal, USA Today. Sometimes a, a successful book in the hands of your target reader that helps them change their life in some way, that's a success. So it's not always dollars. It's not always that number one status. It's how many people have you helped? Have you helped at least one person with that book? I went to a, a book signing once. It's an, it was an author talk for my book after it came out in West Palm, this one bookseller really asked me to come and did a lot of publicity for it and everything. And the day my mom and I arrived to do it, because my mom went with me to all of these, it was torrential, torrential rain. Mm -hmm. The place where the bookstore was was in the midst of the city of West Palm, so there weren't big parking lots out front of the bookstore. You know, it's not like a Barnes & Noble where it's got its own mm -hmm. park. So one person... Literally, one person showed up to my book signing, and mm -hmm. we just chatted for like an hour. <laughs> and at the end of that hour, and of course now all the dogs are barking, <laughs> because I am doing this from home, and uh, the, I think UPS arrived at my door. <laughs> so forgive me, everybody, for all the chaos, but that's what live radio is all about when you don't go to the studio. Um, 
at the end of that hour, he and I became friends, and I helped him get three of his books published. Wow. And we're still in touch, and he said I changed his life that moment. So, so really, that, like, was a su- that was a successful book signing. It was a very successful book signing. Yes, the bookseller would have preferred it if a lot more people showed up. <laughs> yes. Because, you know, he had laid in a supply of books and, and all of that stuff. But, you know, he didn't tell me that he didn't sell the books after the fact. So I'm hopeful for that. And there were no returns back to the books, to uh, my publisher. But you're right. We have to, what does success mean to us for our writing our book? Whether it's one person, hopefully it's more than one person reads our book. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, as an editor, as a ghostwriter, do you also help your, your clients figure out how to market and sell your book, or is that something that you recommend other people help them with? I recommend other people. You know, I, I have a background in marketing and research, so I can talk about it. But to help someone do it, I would really rather send them to the expert in that area because they'll get, you know, the most current information. They'll be able to work with that person one-on-one uh, because those are things that I don't do. But if someone comes to me and starts asking questions, I can certainly answer enough of those questions and then direct them to the, the person that I think would be a, a really good fit for them based on their personality. Again, the personality comes into it, doesn't it? What about if, some, if you know somebody is the right person to help them and they just can't see it because they're stuck in their comfort zone? What do you say to somebody? Because that's even trying to find the right editor and stuff. You want to be stretched when you're working with an editor. You don't want to have massive confrontation, but you do want to be stretched. Or don't you? I think you do. Well, I would, I would agree with you on that. There are people that I've met that don't take criticism, what they see as criticism, well. And I think it goes back to my saying, I can't make an author take my suggestions when I edit their book. And just like I can't stop uh, an author from changing what I had written or adding more to their book or, you know, relitigating their book after I've edited it. You know, that's, that's really a no-no, but I've had authors do that. And if somebody is, is so stuck in their belief system, I am not going to attempt to change them. I can give them the information. I can explain why it's important. I can help them. I can try to help them see how it will benefit them in the long run. But in the end, their brain is their brain, and their decisions are their decisions to make. And Typically, if somebody is so stuck, I, that's not a client I'm, I'm going to want to work with because it's, it will be frustrating for me and for them. Have you ever had to pull your name from a book before it got published? I have wanted to, but no, I, I, I haven't. Um, here's the thing. If you are so, as go back to that, married to your words and you're very stuck, um, if an author, I don't want to say you, but if an author is very stuck in his or her words and refuses to take direction or support for what they're trying to do, then it's unlikely their book will have an impact anyway. So I really don't worry about whether my name is in it or not, uh, just because I can pretty much see that they're not going to meet their goals because they're, they're their own worst enemy. Yeah, I mean, that is, that's interesting to me because you would, one would think that if you know a book is not going the way you'd want it to, that you just wouldn't want your name associated with it at all. But we all come to a moment where it's like, okay, but I did do some work on this. So at what point do you say yes or no? 
what point do you walk away from a client of any kind? It doesn't matter whether it's you're being an editor or whatever. I mean, what do you what do you ask yourself before you say, okay, this just isn't going to work and I need to move on? Are there some questions you ask? Of myself? Of yourself, yeah. Is it, yeah. I think the main question is, 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 is how am I feeling about this emotionally? Am I in the mindset that I need to be in to be the best support for this client that I can be? Am I frustrated? Um, am I angry? Uh, if, if, if it's a very difficult client, which I'm blessed to not have really any, um, it, sometimes relationships run their course. And if I believe that my life and my sanity will be better served by not working with a particular client, then I will, I will walk away. Now, I won't leave somebody hanging in the middle of like a book edit. That's thankfully knock on wood. That's never happened. Um, because I don't, I wouldn't feel good about that. Um, but certainly if, if I have a client that, that wants to come back and do another, another, uh, some more work with me, but it was a, it was a, um, not the most, not the easiest relationship to navigate, I will probably say no. I'm, I'm just at a point in my life, it's, it's less about the money and it's more about my sanity and my happiness. And I think my fiance would agree with that. Um, <laughs> It's, it's sometimes it's just not worth beating your head against the wall trying to convince someone of something that you know will absolutely help them and they refuse to see it. It's a beautiful thought to wrap up the show with. And we have a few minutes left, and I want to make sure that people know how to reach out to you, Liz, so that if they're looking for an editor, a ghostwriter, um, they want to plan a book, that they can reach out to you and get some help because you have so much to offer. Well, thank you. Uh, certainly they can reach me through my website, which is uh, www.fuzzydogllc.com. I just love that. I am on <laughs> dogllc.com. Love it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, that's okay. Um, and I'm on social media as, as Fuzzy Dog LLC. And... Um, you can also find me under my name, Lizbeth Tans, Lizbeth with an S, not a Z. And uh, I also have a Facebook group called The Intentional Business Author. If you want to look, look me up there, um, it's a private group where I share a lot more information about what it is that I do and how to, not just what I do, but I help the people that are in the group get things done. Uh, and what the book. group is again? Uh, it's The Intentional Business Author. It's on Facebook. Okay, and it's a private group, you said? It is a private group. Okay. Um, and and uh, sorry, guys, it's, it's for women. <laughs> coaches, <laughs> coaches, speakers, and entrepreneurs. I don't hate men. Some of my best authors have been men. Just I feel like uh, for the area that I work in, this feels like a really natural niche for me. All right, so everybody, you can reach Elizabeth Tans at fuzzydogllc.com, and she's also on all the social media platforms at Fuzzy Dog LLC, and she does have a Facebook group, Intentional Business Author. So if you are looking for some help to write a book during this time of chaos, maybe getting your thoughts together and knowing how you can help somebody by putting your words to paper, you know, if you're stuck at home and you don't have kids and family distracting you, or if you do, maybe you just need some quiet time for yourself, this could be the time to write that book. So, Liz, I'd like to thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Laura. Um, one quick correction is the intentional business author. Okay. Um, thank you so much for letting me be on the show. It, it was a total pleasure and a joy. And um, I know we'll be talking more, Liz, so thank you. And everybody, remember, the right questions can change your life, whether it comes to writing a book or dealing with the, the threats that the world are under and the panic around coronavirus and just life in general. So make sure you're asking the right questions so you get the right answers. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. 
Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 